having regard to all the considerations the court has taken into account, we conclude that the interests of justice do not require a new trial to be ordered for the appellants. And we therefore make the following order. Judgments and verdicts of acquittal are entered in relation to the appellants. Yes, people. The big day, the big day, the big day. Yeah, and cartel free. The man, them caucus. And turn over the case. Release everything and I'll pay them the money for the suit I come. So, we'll make you wanna listen to the judiciary tell you how they come by the decisions where in a sense most away they'd see it and know it and them finally deal with it. So make a listen to them explain to this lady explain it to us. The Judicial Committee of the Privy Council recommended that the appellant's convictions be quashed. The Privy Council remitted to this court for determination the question of whether the appellants should be ordered to stand a new trial. Over six days, the court comprising Judges of Appeal MacDonald Bishop, T. Williams, and D. Fraser heard arguments by counsel for the appellants on the crown on that question. The court has considered counsel's written and oral argument, as well as the authorities and evidence filed by both sides, and has arrived at a unanimous decision. For a fulsome appreciation of the question remitted to this court for determination, and the court's resolution of the issues and sub-issues raised by the parties relative to that, that question, an abbreviated summary of the background is provided. The allegations in the court below were that the deceased and Lamar Chow, the prosecution's sole eyewitness, had been given two unlicensed firearms belonging to Palmer for safekeeping. The appellant Palmer gave Lamar Chow and the deceased a deadline of 8 o'clock p.m. on 14th August 2011 to return them, with which they failed to comply. As a consequence, Lamar Chow and the deceased were summoned by the appellant Campbell to the appellant Palmer's house at Swallowfield Avenue, Havendale, which we call the Swallowfield premises. They went there by taxi on 16th August 2011, accompanied by Campbell, and on arrival were met by the appellants Palmer, Jones, and, and St. John. The appellant Palmer asked what plans Lamar Chow and the deceased had for replacing the firearms, to which the deceased replied that he would replace them. They were then both attacked, after which Chow saw the deceased lying motionless on the ground with the appellant Jones bending over him. The Mar Chow escaped, but the deceased was never seen again and calls to his mobile phone went unanswered. A team of police officers went to the Swallowfield premises to investigate the alleged homicide. They noticed that the house smelled of disinfectant. When the police returned to the premises on a subsequent visit, they found that the entire interior of the house had been destroyed by a fire. On a further police visit, it was discovered that the rear of the house had been demolished. The police dug at the premises but did not find anything of significance to their investigation. The appellants were taken into custody on 30th September 2011 
and subsequently charged for the deceased murder. They have been detained ever since. The appellants were tried in the Home Circuit Court before Justice Campbell, the trial judge, sitting with the jury. The trial lasted 64 days. During the course of the trial, there were three incidents involving the jurors. The first and second incidents are not relevant to these proceedings and will therefore not be discussed. It suffices to state that after the second incident, the jury panel was reduced to 11 members. The third jury incident came to light on 13 March 2014 the last day of the trial judges summing up of the case to the jury. Following the report of possible jury misconduct, the trial judge convened a hearing in chambers and informed counsel on both sides that he had been made aware that a juror who we call juror X attempted to bribe another member of the jury with an offer of $500,000 to decide the case in a particular way. The trial judge and counsel on both sides questioned the forewoman of the jury in chambers. The forewoman informed them that juror X had spoken to all the jurors and encouraged them to free the appellants without regard to the evidence. There was no evidence to connect any of the appellants with the activities of juror X. Faced with the possibility of having to abort the trial, the trial judge heard submissions from the Director of Public Prosecutions, the DPP, and the Defense Counsel. Despite Defense Counsel's resistance, the trial judge decided to continue with the summing up and handed the case over to the jury that evening. The jury deliberated for over three hours and by a majority of 10 to 1, convicted the appellants of the deceased murder on the same day. The appellants were each sentenced by the trial judge to imprisonment for life at hard labor with the stipulation that the appellants Campbell and Jones should serve a minimum of 25 years in prison before becoming eligible for parole and the appellants Palmer and St. John should serve a minimum of 35 and 30 years respectively. The appellants were unsuccessful in their appeal to this court and appealed to the Privy Council. The Privy Council allowed the appellants' appeal and quashed their convictions on the basis that the trial judge's treatment of the third incident of jury misconduct was a material irregularity in the course of the trial, giving rise to a miscarriage of justice. In the Privy Council's view, the trial judge should have done more to investigate the third incident of jury misconduct and not rely solely on the four women found. Furthermore, allowing juror X to continue to serve on the jury was fatal to the safety of the conviction and was an infringement of the appellant's fundamental right to a fair hearing by an independent and impartial court under Section 16 of the Constitution of Jamaica. Lastly, the fact that the prosecution was prepared to waive the irregularities in the trial did not absolve the trial judge of his responsibility to ensure a fair trial. In all the circumstances, the trial judge ought to have discharged the jury and ended the trial in order to protect the integrity of the system of trial by jury. Against this background, the court has to determine whether the interests of justice require that the appellants be ordered to face a new trial or whether judgments and verdicts of acquittal should be entered. The court starts with the Constitution, which provides that upon conviction, a person should not be tried for a second time unless a court of superior jurisdiction, which is the appellate court, orders 
that there be a retrial. The Constitution did not set out the circumstances in which the court should order a retrial. It is to case law that the court looks to determine what are the principles applicable to the question of whether there should be a retrial. The court looked at all the applicable legal principles governing the question of a new trial, which was set out most authoritatively by the Privy Council in the case of Reed against the Queen. We will not state the citation at this time, but that is in writing. The court also looks at other principles emanating from subsequent cases since Reed, and we have a, an amalgamated list of those factors. There are 12 factors that the court has considered. The seriousness and prevalence of the offense, that's one. Two, the strength of the prosecution's case. Three, the availability of the prosecution's witnesses and exhibits. Four, the av availability of the defense witnesses. Five, delay and whether a retrial can be facilitated within a reasonable time. Six, the time, financial costs, expense, and impact on the court's resources of a new trial if one is ordered. Seven, the ordeal to be faced by the appellants if a new trial is ordered. Eight, the impact of prejudicial publicity on the fairness of a new trial, if a new trial, the fairness of a new trial, sorry, if ordered. Nine, whether the new trial would give the prosecution an unfair advantage. 10, changes in the Jury Act. 11, potential legislative changes in the sentence for murder. 12, the possibility of prejudice arising from the mandatory minimum sentence and minimum term before eligibility or parole. We have considered all the factors governing the court's determination of whether a new trial should be ordered and have given due regard to all the material, submissions and evidence presented by the appellants and the Crown. We commence by stating that the egregious nature and seriousness of the offense in this case is beyond argument. So too is the prevalence of the offense of murder in Jamaica. We make bold to say that the features of this case bear every hallmark of a deliberate attack on and barefaced defiance of law and order involving allegations of transactions relating to illegal firearms, a killing in respect of which the body of the deceased has not been recovered, or should we say an alleged killing in which the body of the deceased has not been recovered, an interference with a crime scene while it was under the control of the police. The court is therefore satisfied that the nature, seriousness, and prevalence of the alleged offense in this case are powerful factors that weigh in favor of a retrial. The court, however, finds that there are several equally powerful factors which, when combined, militate against ordering a new trial. In summary, these factors are the insufficient and inadequate account <coughs> by the prosecution for the availability of its witnesses and trial exhibits. Witnesses and trial exhibits relied upon by the appellants, which tended to support their defense at their first trial, are now unavailable or cannot be accounted for. Three, the appellant's trial in the Supreme Court was complex, lasting 64 days, and utilized a significant share of the court and the appellant's resources. Therefore, the time, financial costs, expense, and impact on the court's resources, as well as other cases 
in the queue awaiting trial, we find that this is significant and it militates against a new trial. Four, the psychological, financial, and um, medical effects that a new trial would likely have on the appellant who have already spent 13 years in custody, which is demonstrated by medical and other affidavit evidence. We look at the medical problems relating to the appellant Palmer, which came through medical reports that stand unchallenged by the Crown and therefore speak to declining health in the penal institution. The court looks at the lapse of time between the commission of the alleged offense and the likely time in which a new trial would take place, which would in our estimation be at least 15 years. We find that to be in order. Six, the unjustifiable interference with the appellant's constitutional rights to a fair hearing within a reasonable time under section 16 of the constitution of jamaica and the potential for that breach or interference we should say continuing if a new trial is ordered we look at the potential prejudice to at least two of the appellants who if convicted after a new trial would be required to serve a longer term of imprisonment before eligibility for parole than that which was originally imposed upon them after their first trial due to the operation of the statutory mandatory minimum for the offense of murder. The court looks at other factors which it did not see swinging the pendulum either way and our judgment will explain it all. We find that this the submissions regarding pre-trial publicity did not assist the appellants. We find that pre-trial publicity is such that you would have to prove that it is impossible to obtain a fair trial. And that question is one for the trial court. What the court did find coming out of the issue of pre-trial publicity is if the mechanisms have to be employed as a cross as a crown had argued that would add to the delay of the proceeding as we have said we have looked at all the other factors but we find by now having weighed everything in the balance that the countervailing the weight is against a new trial our judgment will explain everything in depth but as we say this is for the decision for you to understand what the court has done having regard to all the considerations the court has taken into account we conclude that the interests of justice do not require a new trial to be ordered for the appellants and we therefore make the following order judgments and verdicts of acquittal are entered in relation to the appellants. Oh, there you go, people. There you have it. And that's the explanation I'm giving people. We don't know when the more fly, fly the gate, but That is the decision they make. When our paperwork so I got fill and all them thing there. Eh? So it not necessarily means I'm gonna come out tonight or tomorrow. I never know what kind of things I'm gonna got through, but freedom. Yeah. So next question. Aftermath. Could this now lead to a thing like the O.J. Simpson case where Mark Furman and them did mess up O.J. walk after that 
but them saw him in a level civil suit and mash him up. Make me know what I think, people. Out.